We're delighted to have with us the Yuan family. Um, Christopher has been teaching at Moody Bible Institute for 11 years now. Um, and uh, he, he has a degree from Moody. He's got a degree from uh, Wheaton Graduate School and Bethel Seminary. Uh, has, um, for the recent uh, period of time, been traveling not just the country but the world uh, talking on issues of human sexuality and uh, how the gospel uh, intertwines with it. And uh, you'll be hearing some of that today. Dr. Leon and Angela uh, know what it's like to live through a prodigal child, to walk alongside, to live through that. And um, my hope and my prayer is that those of you who are there, because I know that we have people in our, this room who are, are living through that, that this would be a source of hope for you as you listen to them talk about their story and their journey. Christopher has written uh, some books, a couple of them that I want to make mention of. First of all, the first one is Out of a Far Country, A Gay Son's Journey to God, A Broken Mother's Search for Hope, uh, is their story. Christopher and Angela co-wrote it together. Um, that's out on the book table in the, the lobby. And a new one that uh, Dr. Yuan just released uh, this last Thanksgiving is called Holy Sexuality and the Gospel, Sex, Desire, and Relationships Shaped by God's grand story. It's a wonderful biblical theology on sexuality, but also issues of identity and sanctification and singleness and all of that uh, that goes with it. So it, I would encourage you to visit that table, buy some of those books, give them to your friends, give them to uh, family members. Uh, they're a fantastic resource to have, and we're so delighted to have the Yuan family with us. So would you give them a warm welcome as they come up? America, where money grows on trees and streets align with gold. Well, at least that's what I perceived when I first passed through Ellis Island of New York City on October 30th, 1964. I quickly realized how wrong it was. The first night, I stayed in my friend's rundown apartment in the slum of Harlem. Even more surprising was the day after, October 31st, when little people wear masks, ring doorbells, and say, trick or treat. I said to myself, what have I got myself into? <laughs> and Angela, my college sweetheart, came a few months later and we married the next year. I also assumed just because we were in love, we would simply live happily ever after. How naive <laughs> we were. We were not Christian then after years of unresolved issue and self-centered living, our marriage was a disaster. So with encouragement from both of our sons, we began the paperwork for divorce after 28 years of marriage. So on that same year, May 17th, 1993, our son Christopher came home. He made announcement, I am gay. Since our marriage was hopeless, I did not work as a team with my wife to face this enormous challenge. Not only did I not comfort her, but I also accused her of making our son gay. My son Christopher's declaration affirmed my belief that we should all go our separate ways. Let him be, because there's nothing I can do about it besides. Isn't it more important to be happy? But my wife responded quite differently. You will never think that three simple words, I am gay, could cause so much pain. I actually thought I could threaten Christopher with the automaton to choose the family or choose homosexuality. But Christopher already bought into the lie that he couldn't change that he was born gay. So he said, if you cannot accept me, I have no other choice but to leave. Without any hesitation, Christopher picked up his bags and left. 
Nothing can describe how I felt at that moment. It was worse than receiving news of Christopher's death. He could have cut me with a knife. It would have hurt less. In my mind, Christopher, who was closest to me, and my last ray of hope had also betrayed me. I was at the end of my rope. As my world fell apart around me, I had no more reason to live. So I determined to do the unthinkable. I was going to end my life. Even though I was not a Christian at that time, I felt the need to meet with a minister who gave me a pamphlet on homosexuality. Then I bought a one-way Amtrak ticket to Louisville, where I planned to say goodbye to Christopher for the last time before ending it all. With only my purse and a pamphlet from the minister, I bought on the train thinking that death was the only answer to all my problems. Never been much a reader. On the train, I began to read that pamphlet, which explained the plan of salvation, that all of us are sinners, yet God loves us in spite of our sin. God opened the eyes of my heart. Then I realized that just as God loves me in spite of my sin, I could love Christopher in spite of him living as a gay man. After arriving in Louisville, I called a number from the back of the pamphlet and was connected to a Christian lady who began to disciple me. For six weeks, I immersed myself into the Bible and felt as if I couldn't soak up enough. You see, I went to Louisville expecting to end my life. In reality, I did. One of my favorite verses today is Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. After six weeks, I got a phone call from the lady who was discipling my wife. The lady was very, very excited, and she told me, your wife has surrendered her life to Jesus Christ. She has been saved. I was not very pleased. I told her this is not a good news. This is my worst nightmare because from now on, she has got on her side. <laughs> but what I realized, her transformation was not a Sunday only change, but affected every aspect of her life. What she had was not religion but an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Little did I know, I was also, uh, little did I know I, God was uh, working on me. So I started going to church with her, and a friend of ours invited us to a Bible study called BSF, Bible Study Fellowship, where we grow deeper into the understanding of and love for God and his word. It was while studying the Bible that I also surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. God became the glue, kept our marriage together by drawing both of us to himself. This was God's way for preparing us for the difficult years ahead. As our son Christopher walked further and further away from God. For my childhood years, I was like most other Chinese-American kids. Obey your parents, do well in school, and of course, practice piano. <laughs> you see, I didn't fit in with the other American boys. I looked different. I acted different. God had given me the gifts of music, of sensitivity. And Satan can't take away those God-given gifts, but he can twist the perception of them. And from a young age, I was viewed and ridiculed as being effeminate. The first time I remember having these attractions was when I was nine years old after I came across pornography at a friend's house at nine. At that young age, I was confused and afraid of those feelings. Without any parental guidance on sexuality, those magazines gave me a distorted view of sex, and they soon became my master. With pornography fueling my desires, I had my first encounter when I was 16 years old, but I kept my feelings hidden through high school, college, even the Marine Corps Reserves. 
In my early 20s, I started secretly going out to the gay clubs in Chicago. Then when I moved from Chicago to Louisville, where I was pursuing my doctorate in dentistry, I no longer kept it a secret, and I came out of the closet, and I began living openly as a gay man. I spent most of my free time in the gay clubs, and I went from relationship to relationship seeking intimacy and happiness, which I found temporarily, but it still left me feeling unfulfilled and unsatisfied. So I began experimenting with drugs. Now, I need to be clear, not all gays and lesbians do drugs or are promiscuous. Some do, some don't. But that definitely is part of my story. And when I tell it, I have to tell you my whole story. But I also want to tell you that when you encounter Jesus, he will impact every aspect of your life. So I began experimenting with drugs. But like my other classmates, I didn't have much money. I was pretty poor. And if I was going to do drugs, I needed to find a way to support my habit. And I did that by selling drugs, and I sold to friends, classmates, even a professor. See, I actually thought I could live this double life of being a graduate student by day and a promiscuous drug dealer by night. But three months before I was to receive my doctorate, the administration expelled me. So my parents flew from Chicago to Louisville, and I thought they were going to fight to keep me in school My father is a dentist. He knew the dean very well. All they needed to do was to threaten a lawsuit, and I would stay in school for three months and get my doctorate besides. Isn't that what any good Chinese parent should do anyway? To my surprise, as we sat there in the dean's office, my mother looked at the dean and said, it's not important that Christopher becomes a dentist. What's more important is that Christopher becomes a Christ follower. And they said that they're going to support whatever decision the school made. See, my mom knew that when it comes to her kids, nothing is more important than her children following Jesus, even more important than education, even more important than career. But the sad reality is many people will go to church on Sundays and worship God, but then they will return home and worship idols. The idol of education, the idol of career, the idol of their 401k. And in essence, we make our kids worship the same. Think about this. Do parents put more emphasis upon their children getting their homework done, getting getting a good grade, getting an A, getting into a good school? Or should Christian parents be putting the most emphasis upon their children following Jesus. It's no wonder why many kids who grow up in church go off to college and they leave their faith behind because maybe they weren't even worshiping God in the first place. Nothing is more important than their children following Jesus. But I have to be honest with you. I was not happy about my mom's decision. She was not on my side, I felt. She was on the school side. So I moved further away from them, further away from Chicago to the bright lights and big city of Atlanta, Georgia. And there I quickly took over the drug scene in the gay community, and I became a supplier to other dealers in over a dozen states. In addition, it was nothing for me to have multiple anonymous sexual encounters each and every day. Because according to the world... I had it all, money, fame, drugs, and sex. I had exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and I began worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator because in my world, I had become God. Leon and I had no idea that Christopher was doing drugs, but we knew His biggest need was to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. So I sent him Christian cards several times a week, and I filled them with encouraging words, scripture, and hymns. At the bottom of each card, I signed, Love you forever, Mom. But little did I know he never read them and simply tossed them into the trash. My wife and I knew the only way if, you, if we want to see our son Christopher, we have to fly from Chicago to Atlanta, so we did. 
But on the second day, he kicked us out, not even allow us to call a friend to pick us up. Before leaving, I offered Christopher my very first Bible. Not surprisingly, he refused. But I left it on his counter anyway and walked out. We found out later he took my Bible, threw it into the trash. It was more than obvious that he was totally unreachable and completely hopeless. But my wife and I committed not to focus our own hopelessness, but on the promises of God. Along with over 100 prayer warriors from our church, from BSF, we cry out to God for our son Christopher. My wife began to pray a very bold, prayer. Lord, do whatever it takes to bring this prodigal son to you. In her desperation, she fasted every Monday for eight years. Once fasted 39 days for Christopher. Every morning, she would literally spend hours inside her prayer closet on her knees, reading the Bible, interceding for Christopher, and praying for herself, for me, and for many others. She wrote out many of her prayers, and following is one of those prayers. I was staying in the gap for Christopher. I was staying until the victory is won, until Christopher's heart changes. I was staying in the gap every day, and there I will fervently pray. And Lord, just one favor, don't let me waver. If things get quite rough, which they may, I will never give up on that son, nor will you. Though the enemy seeks to destroy, I will not quit as I intercede though it may take years, but I give you my fears and tears as I trust every moment I plead. I prayed those prayers for eight years, and it seemed that God was not answering them. But during those years, God did answer my prayers, just not in the way I expected. His answer for me was, wait, be still and know that I am God. Looking back upon those years when I prayed for change, God did bring change. The change was not yet in Christopher, but the change was in me and my husband. What God intended for that time was that we will be changed, that we will be transformed, that we will be trophies of God's mercy. As what Chambers said, We are not here to prove God answers prayer. We are here to be living monuments of God's grace. As we live out those years when we are waiting and we are looking for God's answer. So we look, looking at those years of waiting, we learn to walk and live as monuments of his grace as God drew us to himself each and every day. Often answer to prayer doesn't come quickly. And this definitely was not an exception. But my parents were unwavering in their faithfulness to intercede on my behalf. Like the persistent widow, my mother bombarded heaven with their prayers. She knew that it was going to take nothing short of a miracle to bring this prodigal son to the father. And the miracle is exactly what God did. This miracle came with a bang on my door. I opened up my door, and on my front doorstep were 12 Federal Drug Enforcement agents, Atlanta police, and two big German shepherd dogs. I just received a large shipment of drugs, not my largest, but they confiscated my money and my drugs, and I was charged with the equivalent of 9.1 tons of marijuana. 
With that amount, I was facing 10 years to life in federal prison. I had started with a bright future among society's finest in academia, and I found myself in the ditch among society's despised in the Atlantic City Detention Center. So I tried calling my friends. You know those type of friends that say, whenever you need something, just give me a call. Those friends that actually get me more into trouble than anything else. Well, what I didn't know was I had a praying mother at home. Watch out. And she knew that as long as I had those type of friends around, I would find no need for God and no need for my parents. Remember, she loved bold prayers. Well, she had prayed specifically years ago that somehow, some way, God would cause all of those friends to desert me. And on that day, not one friend answered my collect call. So mothers, beware of your prayers. They're going to come true. <laughs> so I was down to the bottom of the list. Home. And I did not want to make that phone call. As I imagined the earful that I was going to get on the other line. But actually, my mother's first words were, Son, are you okay? No condemnation, no berating words, just words of unconditional love and grace. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Notice Paul isn't saying that it's God's anger. He's not saying that it's God's wrath. But it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And even on that miserable day, God was pouring out lavishly his grace and drawing me to himself through the words of my mother. Actually, my, my mom was excited to get that phone call, if you can believe it or not, because <laughs> I hadn't call, called home in years. And she knew without a doubt that this was God's answer to her prayers. So as she hung up that phone, fighting back the tears, she knew she had to do like that good old hymn says, count your blessings. Name them one by one. No matter what storm she was going through, no matter what heartache she was enduring, she had to count her blessings. So she set the phone down, and next to the phone was a calculator. And she tore off a little piece of the adding machine tape, and she wrote down these first blessings. Christopher is is in a safe place compared to before. And it called home for the very first time. As my years in prison passed, she kept adding to this list. And after my years in prison, this list is longer and taller than she is. Both sides. Three days later, I was walking around the cell block. And I was doing my best to stay to myself. I didn't want to mingle very much with those really bad people, you know, those criminals. And I passed by this garbage can. And in jail, they don't take the trash out every day. So it was a mound of trash. It smelled. Flies were circling around it. And I looked at this rubbish and I thought, this is my life. I'm from upper middle class suburb of Chicago. My father has two doctorates. I was only three months away from receiving my own doctorate. I had it made. 
but now I found myself among common criminals. Trash. With my head down, I was about to pass by that garbage can. But something on top of the trash caught my eye. I bent over, I picked it up. And it was a Gideon's New Testament. I took that New Testament back to my cell. I opened up that good book. For the first time, I read through the entire Gospel of Mark that night. But, you know, I wasn't thinking, this is the Word of God. I wasn't even thinking that this will be the answer to some of my problems. I simply thought that I've got an enormous amount of time on my hands and I better pass it somehow. But as many of you know, what we have in our Bibles is not just ink on paper. But what we have in our Bibles, ladies and gentlemen, is the very breath of God. And it is living and powerful and sharper than any double-edged sword, able to cut through the hardest of hearts, exposing my sin, my rebellion. And it wasn't a pretty sight. And I thought things couldn't get any worse. I was wrong. A couple weeks later, I was called into the nurse's office. The jail guards handcuffed me, chained my hands around my waist, shackled my feet together. I shoveled into the nurse's office. She shut the door behind me, sat me down, and I knew something wasn't right. She was uncomfortably struggling with the words. She couldn't even give me eye contact. So she resigned to writing something on a piece of paper and slowly slid it across the desk to me. I looked down and I saw three letters and a, a symbol. It read H-I-V positive. A few days before Christmas, I received Christopher's phone call from jail. The noise in the background could not cover up his sad and hopeless words. Mom, I am HIV positive. His sullen and weak voice trailed off as my body went limp. I felt dizzy, and the world around me seemed to stop. Ever since Christopher told us he was gay, I have lived with constant fear that Christopher might one day contract this deadly virus. A verdict I could not accept. Christopher was sentenced to six years in federal prison. The news of this HIV status was like a death sentence. My worst nightmare was now a reality. Hang on the phone, the pain so grief torn in my broken heart like a knife. Endlessly, I stumble up the steps and drag my heavy body into my prayer closet. Under the cross, I fell to my knees as stinging tears blur my eyes. This affliction was more than I could bear. In the silence of my sorrow, a melody began to play in my heart. The soft and sweet stream of a hymn fill my ears and repeat over and over. It is well. It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea.
A few days after receiving that devastating news, I was in my prison cell all by myself, just contemplating the mess that I've made of my life. I lie there and I look up at the metal bunk above me. There was graffiti, profanity, gang symbols but someone had written something else in the corner. And it read, if you're bored, read Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You see, at the most hopeless point in my life, the Lord God was using the words penned by a prophet thousands of years ago to a rebellious nation, Israel, to tell me that regardless of who I was and what I had done in my past, he still, he still had a plan for me. I had no clue where that plan was going to take me. But God gave me enough faith, enough strength to get through that one day and the next and the next. My transformation was gradual. I wish I could tell you that at that moment, I got down on my knees, I said a sinner's prayer, and then everything after that was perfect, like I had no more problems far from the truth, God began convicting me of the idols that I had in my life. Drugs, that's the most obvious. But within a few months, God delivered me from the bondage of that addiction. God kept bringing to mind other idols, other dependencies, and there was one that I felt like I just couldn't let go of, and it was my sexual identity. I was reading through the Bible And it was so clear to me that God loved me unconditionally. I kept reading, and I came across some passages, three in the old, three in the new, that seemed to condemn that core part of who I thought I was, my sexuality. So I decided to go talk to the chaplain about this. Remember, I'm a brand-new Christian, so I'm very ill-informed about the Bible. And I thought, I want to ask someone who's educated, who studied the Bible for himself. But to my surprise, the chaplain told me that the Bible does not condemn homosexuality, and he even gave me a book explaining that view. So if you think about it, with much curiosity, I took that book in the hopes of finding biblical justification for homosexuality. I had that book in one hand and the Bible in the other, and can I just tell you from a purely human perspective... I had every reason in the world to accept what that book is claiming to justify the way I had been living. But God's indwelling Holy Spirit convicted me that those assertions from that book were a clear distortion of God, His Word, and His unmistakable condemnations against same-sex relationships. I couldn't even finish that book, and I gave it back. To the chaplain, which meant I turned to the Bible alone. And I went through every verse, every chapter, every page of Scripture looking for justification 
for homosexuality. I wanted to find any type of a positive affirmation for a monogamous same-sex relationship. I went through the whole Bible. I went cover to cover several times I had time. I looked and I looked and I looked and I couldn't find any. So I was at a turning point and a decision had to be made either abandon God and his word, live as a gay man, pursue a monogamous same-sex relationship by allowing my attractions, get this, by allowing my sexual attractions to dictate not only who I was, but also how I live. Or abandon pursuing a monogamous same-sex relationship. How? By not allowing my sexuality to control who I was and live as a follower of Jesus Christ. My decision was clear and obvious. I followed Jesus. As the days and the weeks and the months of abstinence passed, I learned several important lessons. First of all, I learned that abstaining from sex is actually possible. I know that might sound weird to you, but I kept was being told by the world that it's not, but it actually is. Who knew? Second, I learned that sexual abstinence is not going to make me psychotic or sick, no matter what Freud and Oprah say. Third, I also realized that sexual abstinence, after abstaining for, for a little while, that actually my sexuality does not have to be the core of who I am. I told myself before, God loves me unconditionally, and that's true. But don't we as sinners like to add to God's truth? I added, so therefore God doesn't want me to change. I bet you hear this from friends who say something like, God loves me just the way I am, so leave me alone. But after reading the Bible several times, I learned that unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. Let me say it again. Unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. My identity should not be defined by my sexuality. My identity shouldn't be grounded in my sexual desires. My identity is not gay, is not ex-gay, is not even heterosexual for that matter, because my identity as a child of the living God must be in Jesus Christ alone. God says, be holy for I am holy. You know, I had thought that if I were to become a Christian, that I would have to become a heterosexual, that somehow the more sexually attracted I were to women, the more of a Christian man I would be. But I realized that even if I had opposite sex attractions, I would still need to flee temptation. I would still need to put to death my sin nature every day. So actually, heterosexuality is not the goal. Because if you think about it, God never says, be heterosexual for I am heterosexual. But neither did he say, be homosexual for I am homosexual. Rather, God said, be holy for I am holy. So therefore, the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality. That is not the goal. But the opposite of homosexuality is holiness. As a matter of fact, the opposite of any sin struggle is holiness. I don't need to focus upon whether I'm tempted because I will be tempted. I don't need to focus upon whether I'm struggling because I will struggle, but I need to focus upon living a life of holiness and living a life of purity because change is not the absence of temptations. Jesus Christ himself was tempted in every way but was without sin. So so change is not the absence of temptations, but change is the freedom, the ability to be holy even in the midst of temptations. Because the ultimate issue is, again, not whether I'm struggling, not whether I'm tempted, but the ultimate issue is that I yearn after God in total surrender and complete obedience. So with that, uh, with that change and obedience, God began to reveal his plan for my life. And he called me to full-time vocational ministry while I was in prison, of all places. And I realized it didn't matter where I was, whether I was in prison or out of prison, because my calling on life would remain the same regardless of the location. And with that change of heart, God did another miracle. And he shortened my sentence from six years to three years, which is almost unheard of in the federal system. 
So with only about a year left of my prison sentence, I knew that if I was going to continue on in ministry after prison, I'd better learn more about the Bible than just prison religion. So I called them, collected my parents, told them I think God's calling me in ministry, and I asked them to mail me an application to the only Bible college I had er ever heard of at that time in our hometown called Moody Bible Institute. But there was silence on the other line because I think they dro both dropped their phones. <laughs> They mailed the application into me to prison. I was so excited when I got it, tore it open, began filling it out, writing my essays until I got to the end where they asked me for references. Not from anybody, but these had to be people who knew me as a Christian for at least one year. I had some slim pickings in prison, <laughs> but I was able to persuade a prison chaplain, a prison guard, and another prison inmate to write my references to Moody. So actually, amazingly, Moody accepted me. <laughs> I was released from prison in July of 2001, and I started the very next month in August of 2001. So imagine the surprise of my classmates when I answered their question, what did you do this summer? <laughs> <laughs> I graduated from Moody in 2005, went on to get my master's in exegesis from Wheaton College Graduate School in 2007. And then in 2014, uh, 2014 I was able to get my doctorate of ministry from Bethel Seminary in St. Paul. And in 2011, I had the immense honor of co-authoring a book with my mother called Out of a Far Country, A Gay Son's Journey to God, A Broken Mother's Search for Hope. We wrote it together, actually. She wrote chapter one. I wrote chapter two. She wrote, chapter, she wrote the odd chapters. I wrote the even chapters because we wanted to tell you from our own voice how you can have the same situation told from two totally different perspectives and then God, this is the best part, God and his power and his grace brought us all back together. Our book now is in seven different languages, from Spanish, Chinese, Chinese and Korean, uh, to also in the back of all of these books and all the languages, there's a free eight-week discussion guide that small groups are using. And we're finding out that more and more Christian high schools are making their kids read this book. One teacher even wrote to us and said, I have the hardest time making my kids read their textbooks, not yours. <laughs> they read it and they're challenged with it. And you know what? It makes sense. I never thought our book would be a textbook, but it makes sense. Parents, I hope you realize our youth are being flooded with resources on sexuality. Don't think that just because you're in Wisconsin, rural part of Wisconsin, that you're okay. If they're on internet, if they go to public schools, the school does not have to tell you when they're teaching about transgenderism. I mean, you would be surprised if you went into the public school's library. What kids, there are picture books about transgender teddy bear. There are picture books for five-year-olds on up about prince and prince. I strongly believe that the responsibility to teach our youth today about sex and sexuality should not rest primarily on the shoulders of the public schools. I don't know if you heard me. I'll say that again. The responsibility to teach your children about sex education does not primarily rest on the shoulders of the public schools. Amen? Amen. And I'm going to also say something else that might maybe seem surprising. The responsibility to teach your children about sex and sexuality does not rest primarily on the shoulders of the youth pastor. You know whose shoulders it rests squarely on? Parents. And I'm going to add something to that. Grandparents. You know why? Grandparents, think back when you were teenagers. How much did you listen to your parents? <laughs> teenagers might not listen to parents, but they may listen to grandparents. So grandparents, go ahead, spoil your grandkids, but also teach them about sex. 
And you might think, my goodness, why in the world would I do that? Because if you don't, I promise you the world will. And they will not teach your grandchildren, parents, they will not, the world will not teach your kids a biblical view of sexuality. Not at all. It's time we take that job and take it back. Amen? There was this grandmother. Uh, we were also in rural Oklahoma. And she, after we spoke, she made a beeline toward our, our book table. And she said, I want 10 books. And I'm like, actually, you just need one. Yo, no, young man, I need 10. He said, one for myself, nine for my grandchildren. And she explained to me, I'm going to mail on Monday every one of my grandchildren this book. I'm going to read it with them, and I'm going to discuss it with them. That's a grandmother that is taking seriously the God-given responsibility we all have to not shove the job of teaching sex and sexuality into the world's hands, but taking it seriously. Not exposing, but equipping. Because I know, parents, you're thinking, I don't want to expose my kids. When is it too early? That's the wrong question to ask today. You know what's the right question? When is it too late? Because if you are not the first person to talk to your kids about sex, I think you're late. Most of the time, kids have already for years learned about sex from their peers, from television, from their teachers, from their own getting on the internet. And we are way, way, way behind the eight ball. And even to think that you can have like that talk once a year when kids are getting daily messages is enough, let's not be naive. Silence is no longer an option. My next book, uh, or my next book, my new book, I keep saying next book, but it's already out in November. My newest book just came out in November, uh, is actually helping people. Our first book is, is more uh, our story, uh, very good to help uh, even younger people to handle this, but also adults, um, even unbelievers. That's the first book. Second book is for believers, and it's helping us to have an, uh, an understanding of sexuality, not just applicable to the individual who has same-sex attractions, but something for all of us. If you notice my cover, which I love, it's very simple, right? Black and white. That's intentional because we live in a world of infinite shades of gray, not just 50. And yet, God reveals to us that biblical sexuality is black and white. God's ways are not ambiguous. He has clearly revealed to us how he wants us to live by God's grace. And so this book is uh, also, we have a free eight, which is a discussion guide, and people are actually reading and finding out. They're like, I'm picking it up, and I'm reading for my gay son, and I actually read, read it. It's actually for me, because let me tell you, holy sexuality is good news for all. It's something that is applicable to all of us, chastity and singleness, faithfulness in marriage. You know what's so cool, cool is that God has given us back the years that the locusts have taken away. And my parents and I, we travel around the nation, around the world, talking about God's grace and God's truth on this issue of sexuality. And then as, as if that wasn't a big enough blessing, God has a sense of humor because he's brought me back to Moody where I'm now teaching in the Bible department. So I went from prisoner to professor. How about that for a resume? <laughs> but God has done, praise the Lord, God has done far, far more abundantly beyond all that we have asked or thought. You know, I look back upon our lives, most of which were far apart from Christ. And I see a lot of bad decisions that I've made, that we've made, some that have resulted in some lasting consequences, one of those being HIV positive. But you know, here's the truth. Actually, I'm no different than any of you. All of our days are numbered. Not one person here, young or old, has been promised tomorrow. But don't we take it for granted? Do you know it took contracting HIV for me to realize that as a child of God, I must 
live with a sense of urgency. You know, this world we live in today, it's a crazy world. We're at each other's throats here in the U.S. We can't even agree on anything. We have orphans, widows, threat of terrorism. We go overseas, there's earthquakes, tsunamis. I look at what's going on in the world today, and I'm convinced the world doesn't need another good Christian, a good Christian who might go to church every Sunday, and they're nice people in the eyes of man, but doing little for the kingdom of heaven. This world does not need another good Christian. But what this world needs, what this world demands are great Christians. Christians who don't settle for mediocrity. Christians who don't care what the person on the left says or what the person on the right says, but they're living to please their heavenly father. Christians who know that they've been crucified with Christ and they don't want to live. Christians who are living with a sense of urgency. Our days are numbered. Are we using it to chase after vain things or are we using it to chase after Jesus? Because whether you are ready or not, there will come one day in the blink of an eye where every one of us will stand before our God, our creator, and my hope is that he can you in the, look at you in the eyes and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. God, you are the one who knit us in our mother's womb. You counted the very hairs on our head. Lord, you, even before you set the stars in their place, you knew us by name. You created all things, everything that was, is, and will be. Lord, you put everything on here on earth and then crowned all of creation with mankind, and you called it very good. God, forgive us. Forgive us for settling for mediocrity. Forgive us, God, for trying to simply please man when we ought to please you. God, we know that we aren't able to live with urgency on our own. So empower us today. Make today a new day. Help us to turn the leaf from mediocrity to greatness. Not in man's eyes, but in your eyes, God, which means being the least of these, which means not coming to be served, but coming to serve. God, we want to make your glory known now and forever. Help us, God, to make that a reality for your name's sake. God, we love you, and we know we don't love you enough. Help us to love you more than life. For it is in the matchless name of Jesus that we ask this. And the people of